And so welcome again to Alan here in the virtual classroom. Welcome to Chuck uh, viewing this uh, recording retroactively online. And uh, yes, I uh, tried the wine from all five classes. I was just mentioning that Chuck was uh, tasting the, the Crema today and, and Alan here in the classroom has the Crema de Bourgogne and, uh, and the Chardonnay as well for later in today's class. Uh, so for today's class, we'll cover uh, uh, two major topics. Uh, we're going to look at specialty wines, wines made in a unique way, like sparkling wines and fortified wines, uh, particularly Champagne, Crema, and Prosecco for sparkling, as well as uh, Port and Sherry for fortified wines. And we'll get into one of one of the best lessons I ever had, which was in my first wine course I took, Enology 101 at the University of Guelph, uh, which was how to read wine labels. It's something that's been a useful tool my whole uh, wine career. Uh, and as I've journeyed over the last 10 years of uh, studying wine and, and being really into, into learning about wine, uh, one of these uh, techniques or tools that I'll, sh I'll share this class uh, has been very valuable uh, over the last uh, 10 years. Great, so from last week we looked at uh, New World wine producing countries such as Canada and United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Chile, and Argentina. Uh, and we also looked at some food and wine pairing principles, such as matching body with body <clears throat> of the wine and the food, pairing to the strongest flavor, and acidity loves acidity, bitterness increases bitterness, etc. If there are any questions from week four's content or, or this week or, or any of the class content, please do uh, reach out. As, as always, I'm, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. <clears throat> and sorry, just a little slight scratch in the, in the throat uh, this afternoon. Uh, so a quick video. Have you seen um, uh, Alan here in the classroom? Have you ever seen a Sabered bottle of wine? S A B E R, Sabered uh, bottle of wine, sparkling wine, of course. Okay, very good. Well, we have a, a quick video here with uh, Madeleine Pouquet, just as kind of an in introductory for our sparkling wine and and uh, wine label uh, literacy class. Always oh, very entertaining, Madeleine Pouquet and Wine Folly. Uh, it can, so the, the trick waste of champagne. Uh, so the trick with uh, sabering a champagne is to have it as cold as possible. So in the fridge, uh, at least overnight, you want it at about 4 degrees, 2, 3, 4 degrees Celsius uh, would, would be ideal. You can always dip the neck in, a, in an ice brine solution or ice, ice bath solution. Because uh, if it's not, if it's uh, less than as cold as possible, it can... Uh, the pressure, there's about six atmospheres of pressure in a bottle of traditional method sparkling wine, and that can it can explode the explode the glass <clears throat> if it's not totally cold. But more often than not, it works regularly, just following the seam, following through just like on a golf swing, and a uh, great way to start a party, great way to uh, entertain your guests and, and have some fun opening up a, 
bottle of sparkling wine. Also the method preferred by Napoleon. Oh, interesting. So Louis prepares each champagne flute by pouring a bit of champagne from one glass to another. You'll have to follow up with him on that. I'd be curious to, to know why he does that. The only thing I can think of is uh, when you're pouring some sparkling wine, um, the first, you know, as it falls into an empty glass, it's quite frothy. Uh, so having a little bit of, um, you know, wine rinse or a little bit of a wine bath already in the sparkling wine flutes uh, can help absorb some of that. Um, on oh, December 21st, fantastic. Well, tell him I say hi. My best regards to, to Louis. And, uh, and hope you enjoy a uh, great, great dinner. Thank you. Great, so let's dive into uh, first section, our specialty wines, kind of broken into two parts. We'll take a look at uh, sparkling wine, which really is a, 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 a wine made in the winery. Uh, of course, the, the quality of the grapes is very important, as we saw in week one, that you can't make good wine from bad grapes. Uh, but more than, more than any other wines, sparkling wines, as well as fortified wines, are a product of good uh, winemaking techniques. So we'll take a look at what those are. For sparkling wine, we'll talk about three major classes of sparkling wine, Champagne, Crema, and Prosecco. <clears throat> there are, of course, uh, many other uh, styles of sparkling wine. Of course, Spanish Cava is a traditional method sparkling wine. You have uh, Method Cap Classique from South Africa, as well as other New World wine producing countries like New Zealand, Australia, California, Ontario, of course. Uh, both British Columbia and Ontario, and Nova Scotia as well, Quebec. And uh, uh, there's a sect, S-E-K-T, from uh, Germany, is the German word for sparkling wine. And so these are there's many different styles of sparkling wine throughout the world. We're going to focus on the three that I feel are the primary styles, uh, or at least three of the most interesting styles, uh, and they'll show a diverse range of uh, sparkling wine making uh, techniques. And for fortified wines, uh, there, are, there are many different styles. It's kind of a, uh, a, a diminishing category, unfortunately. There's some beautiful, it's a very historic style of wine. Uh, we're going to look at the two major types, port and sherry, uh, after the sparkling wine uh, section. So if you have the uh, Cremant de Bourgogne, uh, one thing to know with uh, sparkling wine is you don't want to swirl it. So we saw in week one, uh, the six S's, C, swirl, sniff, sip, swish, savor. Uh, and, but you do with bubbles, because it takes so much work to get the bubbles into there and you want to enjoy them as part of the, as part of the wine, you actually don't want to swirl your bubbles. So, so what you can do is you can do the appearance, the C, and then you can sniff, and, and the bubbles will bring up a lot of the aromatics through the wine and draw them up into your, into your olfactory, into your nose as you, as you assess the wine. Uh, and and really, it, it, it does make it possible to smell it fairly well um, without swirling uh, the wine. Uh, so for this wine at home, uh, Alan, how about assessing how are the bubbles, by which I mean, do they feel uh, really flat and fat and, and kind of um, uh, quite, quite large, or are they more fine, more elegant, more delicate, more intricately uh, intertwined in the wine, more integrated into the wine? With a traditional method, sparkling wine, such as a crema or a champagne or a cava, let's say, uh, the bubbles will be uh, better integrated. They'll be more dissolved, you could say, uh, fine and integrated. Perfect. So that's that's showing good example of a traditional method, uh, sparkling wine. Is that fine bead? And it, you can't really tell in the appearance. The glass and the and can often change the appearance of the bubbles, but it's really on the palate how fine the mousse and how fine the bead is. The glass is a uh, great question. The glass is very important. And uh, the, uh, originally went from a saucer, which was pretty much the worst glass for sparkling wine because the surface area to volume ratio was so high. So they, all the bubbles would dissipate too quickly. And then the, the most, uh, the more traditional recently has been the flute, which is kind of a tall, slender uh, flute glass. And the flute is fantastic for appearance because you can see the beautiful bubbles going up and down the flute. Uh, but what they do in Champagne and other parts of, of France and, and now throughout the world is they'll actually have a little bit more of an open, almost a white wine uh, glass, which you do lose the bubbles a little bit more. Uh, and with a simple sparkling wine, Prosecco or entry level Cremant, entry level Champagne even, uh, a flute is perfectly fine. 
Uh, but especially with a more complex, something that's aged on the lees for a number of years, we'll get into that. Uh, something with more aromas and complexity to it, you want to have it a little bit more of an open uh, glass, a little bit wider rimmed glass, because uh, that will actually expose the aromas uh, to your nose. Whereas in the flute, it can be quite um, quite difficult to pick out these delicate uh, sparkling wine aromas. And so just a couple of questions to think about. Do you like the wine? And as I always encourage my students, if you like it, yes, yes or no, it's usually quite possible, quite easy to make an opinion on, on a hedonistic value. Uh, but the next step from there is what do you like about it? And, and if you can articulate that, it's a good way to build your repertoire of, of um, describing a wine, describing, describing the qualitative nature of a wine. Nice finish, beautiful, smooth, very enjoyable. Excellent. Yeah, fantastic, Alan. You're great. Uh, you've got a great knack for a great talent for, um, uh, maybe a great skill for for describing uh, wines and your assessments of the wines. Not too sweet or bitter. Very good. So let's talk about uh, the 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 king of sparkling wine. Champagne is not only the uh, uh, the top quality pr uh, produced sparkling wine; it's also the top quantity uh, when compared to any other region for sparkling wines. Um, becoming less and less, more sparkling wine is being produced throughout the world. And the most recent stat I heard was one bottle in twelve of sparkling wine throughout the world is produced in Champagne. So it is the largest and the best uh, qu qualitatively. Uh, sparkling wine, uh, generally speaking. Uh, it's actually an Appellation Origin Controle, an AOC, uh, but you won't see the, just like you see AOC Bordeaux or AOC uh, uh, Pouligny Montrachet, you see the, uh, the actual letters AOC on an Appellation uh, bottle. Uh, Champagne is one of the few uh, Appellations, uh, AOCs, that doesn't require writing the letters AOC on the bottle. So we'll just say Champagne. Uh, but it is an appellation, a protected region, a protected name uh, of origin, meaning that um, only if it comes from Champagne in France can it be labeled uh, as such. And it's about an hour and a half to the east northeast of uh, Paris, uh, at about 48, 49, 49 and a half degrees latitude north. So really on the fringe of uh, viable uh, viticultural uh, gr uh, wine growing. Uh, the, the method of producing the sparkle in the wine must be champagne method. Uh, this is also known in other parts of the world as traditional method or method traditionnel, methodo classico in Italian. Uh, a method champenoise was originally permitted, but now is not being allowed uh, due to the protection of the champagne uh, name. Uh, and are you familiar with the champagne method, Alan? It's a very labor intensive method. Um, m multiple steps to it, but it's the way they get the bubbles uh, into it. Yeah, so so just for a quick recap, uh, basically champagne method is about as two uh, fermentations, and the second fermentation occurs in the bottle from which it is later sold. Uh, so, uh, so with a champagne method, you produce a base wine, that's your first fermentation, and then put it into the bottle that eventually the wine will be sold uh, in. And in that, in that bottle, after that first fermentation of base wine, usually a little bit lighter in alcohol, higher in acidity, uh, because the second fermentation is going to add a little bit more alcohol, about 1% or 2% more alcohol, uh, to the final sparkling wine, which will end up around 12, 11, 12, or maybe 12.5% uh, ABV alcohol by volume. And so once you've got your base wine, uh, you'll induce the second fermentation. This is called the tirage, or the prise de mousse. The setting of the foam and so the second fermentation is yeast as well as yeast nutrients including sugar for the yeast and then the bottle is capped with this yeast and the second fermentation takes place in the bottle and this is the best way uh, to get the carbon dioxide integrated into the wine. Um, other wine making techniques will look at the tank method for Prosecco uh, but a third way or third or fourth way is to have just uh, carbonation pumped into the sparkling wine uh, which is the same way they make soda and sparkling water and is generally considered not for good quality uh, sparkling wines and certainly not permitted for champagne and many other uh, sparkling appellations. So once they've done the second fermentation trapped in the bottle, usually under a crown cap, kind of like a soda, uh, soda cap, uh, pop cap, 
<clears throat> then they'll um, they allow the the lees, the yeast, the spent yeast cells, who which have now died, they allow it to age. So in champagne, it's a minimum of twelve months aging on the lees. And for vintage champagne, which you'll you'll notice has a vintage year on it, generally a better quality champagne is minimum of three years on the lees. Cremant, for example, is minimum nine months on the lees, and that just gives it a, that bready, yeasty, toasty kind of brioche. Uh, uh, toast uh, characteristic. And so champagne after 12 months minimum uh, for non-vintage champagne on the lees uh, will be disgorged. So now you've got the issue of you got a traditional method sparkling wine, maybe it's champagne, and it's done its eustatolysis and aged on the lees and given it's the flavorful uh, bready characteristics. But now you have a kind of a cloudy uh, uh, sparkling wine that needs to be filtered. So uh, what happened was in the early 19th century, Madame Veuve Clicquot, uh, Madame Barbe Ponsardin, uh, the, the widow Clicquot, um, uh, invented this, uh, what's called a pupitre. These are uh, kind of A-framed racks, and we'll take a look at a small video on this, uh, that the bottles can be put into neck first and every day turned an eighth of an, an eighth of a turn and eventually go from horizontal to upright, such that the yeast will gently work its way with each quarter turn over several weeks or several months into the neck neck of the um, of the sparkling wine. So let's take a look at a just a quick YouTube video on this riddling. That that's the technique is called riddling, and we see here the A-frame pupitre uh, for these sparkling wines at, at the Maison Krug. So this is every day the remueur, the, the Riddler, uh, will come in and turn each bottle in the cellar a quarter turn. And there are more efficient ways to do this uh, nowadays, uh, including the gyro pallet, which is a large mechanized rack of 500, just over 500 bottles of sparkling wine. And in a large gentle turns, uh, it, can, it can quite a bit more efficiently over the course of a few days to weeks. Uh, riddle and get all the yeast into the necks of these uh, traditional method sparkling wines uh, quite a bit more efficiently. And so once you have the yeast all the way in the neck, it's just a matter of freezing the solution in an ice ice bath, a, gl a glycerol glycol bath, and uh, and popping the crown cap, and then the yeast plug will shoot out, and then dosage, adding a dosage or a topping up of the sparkling wine, uh, along with the sweetness. Uh, so if it's brute. Uh, just a little bit of sugar will be added and then uh, putting in your mushroom cork and labeling and then it's uh, ready for sale. Uh, so kind of the quick and dirty uh, champagne method or method traditionnel, uh, which is also copied in Cava, uses traditional method, of course, using the gyro palette uh, uh, for cost savings and, and efficiencies. Uh, Cremant is traditional method, method Cap Classique in South Africa is a traditional method sparkling wine. And many, uh, you'll often see method traditionnel or traditional method on the label uh, for wines produced in the style uh, throughout the world. In Champagne, uh, only three grape varieties are used. 99.9% uh, .9 of the vineyard is planted to Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, which is a, a mutation of Pinot Noir, an offshoot as a, a an offshoot of Pinot Noir, and Chardonnay, about 40% Pinot Noir and about 30% 30, 30 um, Pinot Meunier Chardonnay. Uh, great question. Uh, two questions here, so I missed the first one, Alan. Uh, first one is both sugar and yeast are added yet yeah, in your liqueur de tirage, so that second fermentation. Uh, you need both yeast and sugar, and the yeast are going to consume that sugar just as though it was a regular fermentation. And so, like we saw in week one, as yeast consumes sugar, that produces alcohol and carbon dioxide. So in this case, we already have our base wine, but we want the carbon dioxide to be trapped from that second fermentation. So in the tirage, liquor to tirage, it is yeast and sugar. And sparkling wine in Canada is uh, very common to see both, actually. Uh, so uh, quite a number of high-quality traditional method sparkling wines, whether it's uh, Featherstone or Henry of Pelham's Cuvée Catherine. Taz produces some fantastic traditional method sparkling wine. Malvoir has their Bizou is phenomenal. Cave Spring, many many high quality uh, traditional method sparkling wine producers in Canada, and they're they're pushing the limits of this uh, lees aging, this this autolytic uh, yeast autolysis uh, character. They might go for a year or sometimes two years or even three or, three or more years 
of that really bready, toasty, uh, brioche, uh, savory uh, aroma. And we also see a little bit of uh, uh, Charmat method, which we'll uh, cover uh, under Prosecco, the, the tank method, which is similar to the method traditional, um, but we'll we'll talk about that after. So, so you do see, see both. And then of course, uh, some of the uh, classic producers, such as um, uh, Bright's and Andres, uh, producing carbonated method, you know, baby duck and presidente and uh, some of these uh, uh, staple classic, classic Ontario wines uh, of, of fairly average quality uh, being produced in the carbonation uh, method. So Champagne, I found it interesting that they have uh, many crayery underground uh, cellars dug out of the uh, chalk limestone with 1.5 billion bottles currently aging in their cellars. Uh, if you go to the um, Commission Interprofessionnelle de Vin de Champagne uh, website, civc.france, uh, you'll see a lot of great information on, on some of the aging and the methods and the producers, uh, some of which include Moe Chandon, Veuve Clicquot, of course, yeah, that's uh, part uh, one of the brands owned by Moe et Chandon along with Dom Perignon and Krug. Um, there are some uh, many other great producers like Boulanger, uh, Louis Roderer, including their uh, Tête de Cuvée uh, Cristal. Yeah, Moët Chardon is a, a major producer, a quite, a biggest producer by far, especially including Veuve Clicquot and some other uh, key brands. Uh, one of the major cooperatives is Nic Nicolas Feuillet. Uh, this is a cooperative such that many growers will sell to the cooperative and the wine will be produced and marketed, sold and distributed under the cooperative uh, name, as well as L'Anson, a major uh, uh, producer uh, in Champagne. So a uh, slight shift into Cremant, which is uh, uh, not much of a stretch away from Champagne. It is essentially a traditional method, or it must be a traditional method, produced Champagne method, produced sparkling wine, produced in France, uh, but outside of the Champagne borders. So Alsace is uh, the largest producer, and we see a lot of Cremant produced in the Loire Valley and Bourgogne, as well as Bordeaux and some other uh, regions as well. And... Um, uh, generally, they use the, the grape varieties that are available. So in your Cremant de Bourgogne, Alan, you may have a Pinot Noir or Chardonnay based. It's possible they're using Aligoté or even Gamay Noir. Um, but uh, most more likely than not, there's majority will be Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in the Cremant de Bourgogne. Uh, Loire uses uh, Loire Valley uh, grape varieties, Alsace predominantly Pinot Blanc, as well as Chardonnay, Pinot Noir in their uh, rosés, for example. And these can be excellent values, um, uh, especially in the in the higher end. Often twenty dollars, at most twenty five or, or thirty, uh, for a very good quality traditional method with long lease aging, uh, great food wines, uh, more similar to Canada's uh, value level with a crema. Um, whereas with uh, champagne in our market here in Ontario, it tends to be about forty or fifty dollars uh, for an entry level. Uh, champagne, which which may not necessarily be as good or better than you know a twenty or twenty five dollar Cremant or or a traditional method uh, Ontario. About thirty, yeah, that's interesting because um, they used to, the LCBO used to only really bring in around the twenty twenty two dollar range, and I think a big part of it is people are starting to. Um, know a little bit more about uh, Cremant. So so they're bringing in these more interesting. Yeah, fantastic. And, and that's exactly it is for $30, you can get a, a really quality that that for champagne, that quality would be maybe twice that uh, price. Okay, so uh, looked at traditional method champagne and Cremant. Um, another different way of making a sparkling wine is called the tank method also known as uh, Method Charmat, named after French uh, creator of this tank method in the late 19th century. It's also known as Method Couve Close. Couve Close just referring to a closed tank. So Couve would be a, a French word for a tank. 
And so this is the closed tank method. It's a tank method of producing a sparkling wine where you also have two fermentations uh, such that the base wine is fermented and then in large volumes put into a maybe 5,000 plus liter tank. Uh, can can definitely go more, larger than that. And it'll be closed, it'll be pressurized so that the second fermentation, again, yeast and yeast nutrients, yeast sugar, uh, is added to that base wine and a second fermentation takes place in this tank and all of that sugar gets converted into uh, a little bit of alcohol, but especially the bubbles, the, spark, uh, the carbon dioxide that gets incorporated into this uh, tank method sparkling wine. Um, uh, so at that point you have, uh, it's kind of a, a, an, a scale, an economy of scale um, where uh, uh, because uh, it's not done in each bottle and you don't have to riddle each bottle by hand or even by dryer pallet, uh, what they'll do is with, with the second fermentation, it might age for three months or six months or nine months or more on the lees uh, and then gets uh, bottled under pressure. It gets uh, taken off the lees uh, and out of the, removed from the tank and into bottle all under pressure to maintain the uh, sparkling wine uh, effect. And Prosecco is made in this way. Um, Jackson Triggs, I think for $15 or $17 maybe now, has a Method Couve Close uh, sparkling wine that's quite good. Um, a lot of sect, German sparkling wine sect, is produced in the tank method as well as some traditional method. Um, and really wines throughout the world. Prosecco, Asti is essentially a, um, uh, for example, Moscato di Asti or Asti uh, Spumante is essentially a tank method, a variation of the tank method sparkling wine. Uh, but many regions, Australia, California, New Zealand, will produce a, a tank method. Uh, and so Prosecco is, is tank method. It comes from northeastern Italy, um, predominantly around Veneto, and kind of the, uh, the better quality Prosecco. And there is uh, some very good quality Prosecco from uh, the DOCG, Conegliano Valdobbiadene. And the grape variety Glera, as you have here, Alan, is a, is a white grape variety. That's an excellent observation. Because uh, the grape variety used to be called Prosecco, uh, and then the Prosecco producers in 2009 wanted to protect the name Prosecco because of the demand and popularity for this uh, sparkling wine. So they uh, enlarged the zone to include the village of Prosecco, which is in Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. Uh, and then they were able to name the appellation Prosecco, and they changed the uh, name of the grape variety to its tr historic name, Glera. Uh, which thereby protected the name Prosecco to only come from the Prosecco region of Italy. So it was a very, very clever move. Uh, and, um, and and just to answer your question, is a white, uh, white grape variety. Fairly neutral in flavor, and especially with the high yields, they can yield up to 13 or even 18 tons per, per uh, hectare. Uh, which is a very high amount of fruit coming off a, a small area of land. So they tend to be fairly neutral, fairly easy drinking. Uh, although although the better quality ones can be very good uh, value indeed. Okay. Great. So I don't I don't have my um, poll questions on here uh, with this new software. So let me just pause the recording. I'll pull them up. Fantastic, and then <laughs> I was really appreciative that that's that's where we met. Alan was was at Taz. Um, great, so I've got I've got the questions here. So let's let's go over them. Uh, so question number one is true or false? Champagne is produced using the traditional method, the most complex way of creating a sparkling wine. True. Yep. Must be a traditional method. Very good. And if you're following along at home as well, Chuck uh, uh, and Alan, uh, question number two uh, is, uh, is actually a question on port. So let's uh, let's carry on with the lesson uh, before diving into that. So we'll take a look at uh, fortified wines, uh, which is very similar to sparkling wines are a, a wine style, a wine category that are essentially produced in the winery. Again, you need good quality fruit to make a good quality wine, uh, but some of the techniques used in producing fortified wines uh, are, are based in the in the winery. So fortified, what, what do they mean by fortified wines? Uh, they mean there's been some grape, usually grape brandy or any type of spirit has been added to the wine to, to strengthen it, 
historically, uh, it was for the long voyages. So in the 18th and perhaps 19th century, uh, wines were being uh, shipped from, uh, from Portugal and from Spain uh, and other wine producing countries uh, to uh, markets in Northern Europe, predominantly, whether it was the UK or Netherlands. Uh, and so they uh, they found that by adding a, a measure of grape brandy, uh, which is a spirit based on grape, uh, based on uh, distilled wine, and by adding this brandy, the the wines would last longer and taste a lot better once they reached their final destination a few weeks or maybe perhaps a few months later on the on the sea voyage. Uh, and so it's a very uh, traditional style of producing a wine, and and the re the reason was originally. Um, uh, just for that um, protective uh, factor. Uh, so port is uh, fortified with 77% grape spirit, and it's in about a one to four ratio. So they'll have about uh, four four hectoliters of wine for every hectoliter of um, of spirit. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is uh, quite. It's it's a noticeable amount. Uh, every other style of fortified wine, whether sherry or uh, um, Vain du Naturel in France, such as Benules or Maury or Muscat de Baume de Venise, or many other fortified wines, Madeira, for example, we use a neutral spirit, 96% uh, neutral spirit, and, and add maybe 5 or 10% of that. Uh, but with port, it's fortified to final ABV of about 20%, uh, alcohol by volume, uh, and the majority of that, uh, so, so it's a larger amount of um, of grape brandy that's used in the in the fortification process. Uh, so with with port uh, wine, a, a key factor is that uh, port is fortified during the fermentation, and we'll see sh that sherry on the next couple slides is fortified after uh, uh, fermentation. So because port is fortified during the fermentation, uh, they have to do a very vigorous um, extraction of the red uh, color from the red wine grapes, as well as the tannins and the flavor. So they'll have the, you know, the the people kind of marching, stomping on the arm in arm on the um, on the grapes on the pumice for about two or three days as it ferments, and then they'll add the fortification during fermentation, which means that the yeast will will die off, and you'll be left with unfermented sugars. So port is always sweet; uh, it will always have about ten percent, nine to ten, sometimes twelve percent. Uh, residual sugar because it's been fortified and hence the yeast have died uh, during fermentation. Uh, 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 the grapes are grown in the Douro Valley. This is the Douro River, which starts in Spain as the Duero and flows through Portugal in kind of inland, warm, dry Portugal um, over one of the large uh, Sierra ranges. Uh, so it's very dry Douro Valley, beautiful. Uh, have you ever been uh, to the Douro, Alan? I've heard it's, uh, I've got some friends who have been there and they say it's uh, one of the most beautiful uh, places. Everybody says it's pretty much one of the most beautiful places. It's got these uh, craggy mountain slopes and everything's terraced vineyards and uh, the beautiful winding Douro going through. Yeah, same here. <laughs> and uh, so, so that's where the grapes are grown is upriver up in the upper Douro. Uh, and then traditionally the, the wines were shipped down in Barco, uh, Rebellas, I think it was a, the Portuguese term for the small boats that would take these casks of wine uh, that have been uh, fortified down to Oporto on the Atlantic coast. Uh, this is Portugal's second largest city and uh, the namesake for port wine. Uh, and this is where the, the shippers, whether they were British shippers or uh, Dutch or uh, Portuguese shippers or French, uh, they'd be based in the village of Oporto. And they'd age the wines in this more maritime, cooler Atlantic-influenced uh, coastal region. Uh, and so they would either age them, uh, depending on wine style, they might age them in large oak uh, barrels, which will give kind of a oxidative, caramelly, nutty, a um, uh, little bit smoother, softer, brown-colored uh, wine. So that would include tawny. Uh, you know, 10-year-old tawny, 20-year-old tawny. Uh, and the other style is a tawny uh, vintage from a particular colieta or from a particular year. So a vintage tawny port. Or sorry, that, maybe that's a little bit confusing. A tawny port from one vintage uh, would be called a colieta. So that will have the year the grapes were grown uh, labeled on the, on the bottle. 
And if you like tawny ports, such as 10 or 20, 30, 40 year old tawny, which are just an average blend of 10 years old, they're not exactly 10 year old wines in there. They'll be average from maybe eight to 12. And um, if you like a tawny port, Colieta tends to be excellent value uh, because they're not as well known. So you can get a 15, 14 or 15 year old Colieta tawny port, um, uh, which is aged in the barrel. The, all of these tawny and Colieta ports are barrel aged. Uh, for for the length of time that the the colete is labeled or the tawny age indicated is labeled, um, so a similar style and but generally better value from from a colete uh, port. Uh, to, uh, following up on this question, uh, another style of port wine is aged in the bottle. Uh, so, for example, vintage port, which is considered the best, uh, certainly the most age worthy style of port uh, wine is again a sweet, fortified, a uh, little bit higher in alcohol uh, wine um, um, that is aged just in bottles. So they'll age it for about two years in wood, and then these, these top quality grapes and top quality wine is then put into bottle. And this is perhaps the longest lived, uh, most age-worthy wine there is. Uh, a good vintage port, the most recent vintage uh, that was declared was 2016. Uh, and going back to 2011 was one of the best, they called it a, a vintage of a century. And these wines will age for 50, 80, maybe 100 plus years, uh, developing into these rich, savory, complex, ethereal, um, delicious uh, tertiary aromas. Uh, late bottle vintage is also a, a bottle aged port, uh, similar to vintage, perhaps lesser quality grapes, but more accessible. Uh, with a little bit further aging in, in oak. So vintage port spends two years in the barrel and then the rest of its life in bottle. Late bottled vintage, also known as LBV, will spend four to six, perhaps seven years in a barrel and then quickly and then bottled late. So bottled after those four, six or seven years uh, and then the rest of its time in bottle where it's ready for consumption or some uh, LBVs that have a driven cork will also age uh, in the bottle after after purchase uh, so uh, going down the Portuguese coast past Lisbon uh, into into just before the Strait of Gibraltar you have in southwest southwest uh, Spain in Andalusia you have the region of Jerez or Jerez uh, which is the sh uh, sherry producing region uh, this is a very dry uh, region that produces dry fortified wines uh, the wines in Jerez, sherry wines, are fermented after um, fermentation. So the yeast have fermented all of the sugar uh, from the grapes, usually Palomino, uh, uh, Fino grapes. Uh, and the yeast have fermented all those into dryness. Uh, but it's really with the aging process that sherry uh, becomes defined. And so uh, there are two different styles of aging for sherries. Uh, one is biologically, the other oxidatively. And biologically, so it involves a, uh, a both styles involve a, a wooden barrel, a sherry butt of, I believe, 600 uh, liters. And they won't be filled, they'll be filled only five, six full. So there's an ullage and an air, um, some room between the top of the wine and the top of the barrel on the inside. And so in this ullage, it allows, if it's only been fortified to 15 or 15 and a half percent, it allows a biological layer of yeast called floor. F-L-O-R, it's a beautiful Spanish word for flower, and it indicates the style of yeast that grow particularly in the region of Jerez, uh, especially on the coast in San Lucar de Barrameda and Puerto, uh, uh, Puerto Santo. Uh, and so this floor will produce, uh, produce a layer of yeast called floor that protect the uh, sherry that's aging underneath the floor. Um, protect them from the oxygen so it's aged biologically so it'll still be pale yellow uh, it is a naturally occurring yeast uh, particularly in this region we also see in the region of dura in eastern france east of Bur burgoyne this uh, flora yeast this w indigenous wild uh, uh, yeast uh, species uh, that produces a protective layer over the wine and it actually feeds off the wine and there's an interaction where it produces some flavors, giving uh, sherry that unique kind of almond skin, aldehyde, uh, sherry type type flavor. And so Manzanilla is a type of biologically aged wine from San Lucar de Barrameda on the seaside coast. 
generally considered the finest of the of the bio, uh, biologically aged. And if it's produced in uh, Jerez uh, or other parts of uh, of, Sh of Sherry region, Jerez, uh, it's labeled as a phenol. And these are generally considered the, the better quality wines and more delicately flavored. Phenomenal with food if you pair this with anything uh, Spanish, such as Iberical ham or uh, roasted almonds. Um, very, very food friendly, especially tapas. Uh, and, and just uh, quite appetite stimulating uh, as uh, on their own. Uh, a different style is if they for fortify it a little bit higher, maybe 17 or 18 percent uh, total uh, final alcohol by volume uh, in the sherries, then the the floor won't be able to establish. It's too uh, high of an alcohol environment for them, and so with the ullage, with the air space in the in the in the barrels. Um, the, the wine, the sherry wine, will age oxidatively. And so you might have something like an Oloroso. It'll be more nut, a brown color, a little bit more walnut uh, flavored, and a little bit kind of uh, roasted caramel, roasted walnut uh, taste. Uh, and Amontillado is a style that originally starts off as a fino, uh, but they realize it's not going to take to the perfectly to the floor. So they increase the alcohol. So it's fino wine that has been aged oxidatively. And this gives it that more kind of hazelnut, perhaps kind of a mid-ranged uh, nutty uh, character to an Amontillado. Uh, different style, and this is perhaps what Cherry is best known for uh, because it was extremely popular in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and even today is a very popular style of Sherry, are cream Sherries. And these are essentially um, one of the styles, whether it's Fino or Amontillado or Oloroso. Uh, and then they're... they're uh, Fermented to dryness, fortified, just like any of these styles are. And then they have a rectified concentrated grape must. So it's abbreviated to RCGM. It's essentially pure uh, glucose, pure grape sugar. And so they have this RCGM, rectified concentrated grape must, added back to these finished um, uh, styles of uh, sherry. Uh, so it, it's not necessarily that it's a bad quality. Uh, many of the sherries that do have this sugar added to them, it's uh, they are not very good quality grapes, but you can get some good quality pale cream or cream or medium cream uh, sherries as well. If it's used, if it's based on a good quality base uh, sherry, uh, and perhaps if it has a, a, a better quality sweetener added to it, such as uh, Pedro Jimenez. So that's the uh, grape variety. I believe I have it spelled correctly there. Uh, uh, oops, sorry. And uh, that's a different grape variety I was just uh, reading on. Ximenez. Something like that. So PX, Pedro Ximenez, the second spelling there, um, is a different grape variety. And this is uh, produces its own style of uh, sherry wine. And these are raisinated uh, grapes. So the Pedro Jimenez grapes, PX grapes, are harvested and left out in the sun on uh, straw mats. And they'll raisinate, they'll concentrate the sugars, dry, uh, dry out the, the uh, water of the grapes, uh, and then get fermented into a naturally sweet, uh, fortified uh, sherry wine. And some of these PX wines are long-lived. You can frequently get some from the 60s or 50s or 30s, you know, very old uh, PX wines that are just hauntingly uh, complex and uh, delicious. Uh, it's also one of the sweetest styles of wine, uh, so great on vanilla ice cream. Uh, or other uh, very sweet desserts. Okay, so uh, just one question on port wine. So question on port. Port is named so because A, it was always imported, B, it was always drunk on the left side of the ship, or C, it was named after the town of Oporto. So port was name so because of C. Yes, very good, Alan. Thank you. I think you're batting a hundred, uh, batting a thousand so far in the in the course. Uh, so that's great to see. Um, and yes, yeah, so so uh, um, named after the town of Oporto, uh, which had very strong trading links with uh, the British Empire and, and Brit, uh, British merchants uh, and the British uh, uh, market. Uh, and so In the Hall of Fame. I'm not sure if I get that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
Yeah, in, in the Knowledge Eyes uh, Hall of Fame, batting a 1,000, yeah. Very good. Great, so let's uh, pause there. Covered um, sparkling wines and fortified wines. I'll pause the recording, and we'll take it up uh, in just a few minutes looking at uh, uh, how to read a wine label. Okay, so great. Welcome back. Uh, looking forward to our second half of our fifth and final class today on how to read a wine label. Uh, so as I'd mentioned at the top of class, this was one of the best uh, techniques I've ever learned uh, was how what to look for on a wine label. And I, I practice this very often, especially as a product consultant at the LCBO. Um, anytime I'm at the LCBO or any uh, you know wine region or anything like that, I'm always scouring the label. And, and once you know what to look for and you repeat looking for these items uh, over and over again, you develop a good understanding of um, different wine regions and what the wine might taste like. And I would say I could probably create a dry tasting note. So I'm not having tasted the wine, but just reading the label. Uh, from from almost any um, uh, from any wine, uh, German is difficult. One of the more difficult for sure, uh, and Italian can be can be quite difficult. Uh, I'd say German's probably probably the most difficult uh, for for consumers. Um, uh, but we'll take a look. We we won't get as specific as different countries, uh, but we'll look at kind of old world and new world stylistic differences in their labeling. And kind of give a start with a general uh, overview. So let's start with that. Uh, for every bottle of wine, I always look for a producer, as well as the region. More often than not, it'll have a, an appellation or a designation, a geographical indication. Uh, it may or may not have grape variety or grape varieties listed, uh, and it'll almost always have vintage on it. Uh, and it may have the name of the wine. Uh, so, for example. Um, uh, uh, Ladybug would be the name of a of a rosé from Malavoir producer, uh, and there are different different, especially in in Italy, there are many uh, names of the wine. So it just takes a bit of skill to navigate how to tell the difference between a producer or even perhaps a region uh, or an unknown grape variety and the, and the name of a wine. And with practice, you'll. Uh, and especially having taken the course and, and learning about some of these old world and new world regions, uh, you'll start to understand um, labels better and better as you practice. So if this was a, a sample old world label, you'd have the producer at the top. Um, again, it'll it'll always list the producer. Uh, this is our region here, Chateau Neuf du Pop, Pope's New Castle. And just underneath uh, all French labels, and, and most uh, European labels will have an appellation uh, to it. And, and many, almost all New World uh, uh, labels as well. So in this case, it says Appellation Chateau Neuf du Pop Controle. A little bit kind of tough to read in the fine print there. Uh, but uh, AOC or AC, Appellation Controle. And it'll have the, the region uh, sandwiched in between Appellation and Controle. So again, if you have this uh, Chardonnay there, Alan, a uh, great time to, to open it up. Uh, same for you, uh, Chuck, if you can. Uh, so something to think about is reading the label of this Malavoir Chardonnay. What clues imply what the wine will be like? Can you infer anything about the style, the taste of the wine, uh, just from the label? And so as you kind of sleuth this Malavoir Chardonnay label, uh, uh, and now, and now, presumably, as you taste it, um, is it like you thought it would be? Were you able to accurately or, or reasonably accurately uh, deduce any information on the style of the wine? Yep. Yeah, very good. Yep. Yeah. So, and again, from that information, whether it's varietal, Chardonnay, if we go back to class two, you can understand that in this cooler appellation that's on the label, and perhaps vintage, is it the 2016 or do you have the 2017 there, Alan? And you can kind of piece together 2016, very good. So you can try see, sort of understand that this might be a medium body, a little bit higher in acidity from the cooler climate in this appellation. You know, Chardonnay, so it'll probably ripen pretty well. If you check out the alcohol by volume, uh, you can probably see that it's either medium bodied with maybe medium plus acidity and medium alcohol, 
or if this was a California Chardonnay, let's say, for example, it might be high alcohol and therefore a warm climate, and you might expect riper uh, tropical fruits. So here at 13%, I might expect pear and peach, perhaps lemon and green apple, perhaps melon, and maybe even banana. 2016 was a fairly warm vintage, so depending on how late they ripened it. But you can expect kind of a medium alcohol and a medium plus acidity, uh, just, on, just from reading the label. A New World label generally tends to be more streamlined, uh, a little bit more uh, easy to understand. Uh, it will always list the producer. In this case, we have Rodney Strong. Uh, it does have the region or the American uh, Viticultural Area, ABA. <clears throat> so the American Viticultural Area of Russian River Valley. And again, this gives us some clues. It's a little bit more coastal within California, close to that mitigating uh, cool San Pablo Bay as well as Pacific Coast. Uh, so a little bit more restrained than further inland, such as Napa Valley uh, or some of the warmer inland valleys in California. And a list grape variety, which uh, on international markets uh, for American wines and the standard for Europe and also Canada is 85% of the stated uh, variety. 85% uh, of the wine must be of the stated variety. So they, they may label, they may be able to add 15%, up to 15% of other uh, grape varieties to this uh, Pinot Noir wine. Uh, so in addition to some of the earlier clues we'll be looking for, such as producer, vintage, grape variety, region, and perhaps name. Uh, yeah, it, it may stay the state on the back, uh, kind of in some of this information, such as producer's address. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> unless it's a California appellation, which it can be, or it can be an Oregon appellation, uh, it can be, uh, it can have a state appellation. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Behringer, um, uh, uh, California Cabernet Sauvignon uh, can come from anywhere in California and that would label it as a California wine. Uh, whereas with this label here, the, the sample label I've posted, um, it's more specific. It's a more defined, smaller, defined, perhaps better quality uh, Appalachian, uh, American Viticultural Area, in this case, Russian River Valley. Uh, but you will always find the state and country on the on the back label under the producer's address. It must uh, legally must have listed the alcohol by volume. I find California not to not to uh, beat on them, uh, but uh, they find them. They they almost always have it in very fine print, or, or fairly often have it in very fine print. The alcohol by volume, so you can have to kind of look, search it out. And if your eyes aren't as as good, perhaps. Uh, it can, can sometimes be easy to miss. But every label that's sold uh, commercially in in most uh, industrialized countries uh, require the alcohol by volume to be listed within 1% uh, either way. So, for example, a wine that says 13% could be anywhere in actual alcohol from 12 to 14% alcohol by volume. It must list the volume of the fluid inside. This can be, uh, there can be a variance. I was reading a, a fairly advanced winemaking uh, technology book, uh, and uh, the author, David Bird, said that it can be anywhere from 720 to 760 milliliters within any given uh, bottle of wine and still be labeled as 750. So, so if you can see the top of the, you know, the ullage within the bottle, you can, sometimes you can pick out a few more <laughs> uh, milliliters uh, in your wine. It should state the wine category, such as white wine, red wine, rosé wine, and should have the country of origin. And a general declaration uh, contains sulfites, which in fact all wines contain sulfites. And this is a real hot button topic uh, these days. Um, but it's a natural byproduct of the fermentation process. Uh, and also it's uh, used by winemakers as the best known uh, antioxidant and antimicrobial. Uh, so uh, it is used, uh, you, you do want um, a little bit of sulfur used in the winemaking process. Uh, the reason that uh, Canada and Europe and many uh, New World countries um, could, uh, require labels to post is a federally uh, appointed legislation that wines must stay contain sulfites as for asthmatics uh, who can have a very adverse reaction to sulfur. Um, and so uh, it is for it is required, mandated legally, uh, to have this uh, phrase on the label. That was correct, Alan. Yeah, both added and natural. Yeah.
Uh, so you may have optionally, if it comes from a specific appellation, they'd likely like to promote that uh, because it's gone through much more rigorous um, winemaking and grape growing techniques to follow these AOC or DOCG or VQA uh, labeling laws. Uh, if it's certified organic, it may have on the back uh, the, or the certifying organization, whether it's ProCert or different European uh, organic uh, uh, regulation bodies. Uh, you can get some useful information, particularly on Chardonnay, uh, uh, if, as to whether it's oaked or unoaked, because as we saw in week two, Chardonnay, for example, uh, is really influenced in its wine style by the winemaking as well as the uh, terroir. Uh, so oaked or unoaked can give you some information as to whether or not the wine is aged in oak barrels and or used oak chips and oak saves to give that oak uh, flavoring. And have you come across this uh, term, Alan, estate bottled? And in French, mise en bouteille au domaine? Yeah, so so domain, so this just indicates that the wine was uh, both grown and vinified, both grown and produced on site. So the uh, so the Cremant, for example, that you have there uh, would have grown on the same property that it was vinified, uh, indicating um, perhaps perhaps better quality, uh, though not necessarily. Okay, so question on um, wine labels, true or false? True or false, all wines must have on their label the alcohol level, the country of origin, and the wine category, e.g. red wine. And true, yeah, maintaining that perfect record. Uh, very good, so that is true. So they must contain uh, the alcohol level, the product category, and the country of origin. Somewhere on the label. And that brings us to uh, our final activity uh, for today's class. Uh, it's an activity I, I created called But Which Wine? And the idea was I was hoping this would help you next time you're at a wine store uh, or at a restaurant looking at a wine menu, talking with a sommelier or talking with a clerk at the LCBO or, or other wine store that you may be at. And it kind of ties in uh, pretty much everything we've covered over the last five weeks. Uh, so uh, you can ignore the breakout room uh, 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 with one or two people in the class. We can just do it in the, in the classroom here um, and ignore the small groups. But basically on the next slide, there's going to be uh, three different reasons that I've labeled as shopping trips. And these will be three different reasons why you might want to buy a bottle of wine. So kind of our motivator. And then uh, just underneath these three reasons, you'll see six bottles of wine to choose from. I've labeled these the wine shop shelves. So you've got your three reasons being your shopping trips, and you've got your six bottles of wine being the wine shop shelves. And just to have an open discussion, you know, you and I here in the classroom, Alan, and uh, you as well, Chuck, uh, if you'd like to reach out um, to, to do this, um, discuss which wine you would choose to go with each of the shopping trips. So you're going to try and match one of the, one of the wines for uh, each of the three shopping trips. And, of course, uh, being an educator, I firmly believe uh, that there are no right or wrong answers to this. This is more an exercise of practicing some of the uh, rationale, some of the learning uh, that we've accomplished over the last five weeks and uh, and applying it to, to a real-life uh, scenario. So if you're all set, Alan, let's go into the liquor store. So our shopping trips, first one is you need a wine to go with pasta in a bolognese sauce. And on our wine shop shelves, we have the most of these are, are wines from the course that I've tried to use, uh, perhaps the exception of the Oyster Bay, but this is the Oyster Bay Sauvignon Blanc. We also have the Kendall Jackson Chardonnay from California. The Oyster Bay is from New Zealand. Chianti is a great answer. And why would you select the Chianti to go with your pasta in bolognese sauce? Midweight and midweight, perfect, that's right. So bolognese is, is fairly midweight, medium plus, let's say. You know, meat sauce, a little bit of uh, texture from the tomato sauce, the, the pass itself is fairly weighty, uh, but not as high weight as something that might pair with the red, not Shiraz. 
Uh, and definitely the Chianti Classico is going to be 13.5, maybe 13, maybe 14%, kind of mid-weight, um, pairing perfectly with, with the bolognese sauce. Excellent. Uh, so let's go shopping trip number two is you want a wine to relax and enjoy on your Friday night. So out of the Oyster Bay, Sauvignon Blanc, Kendall Jackson Chardonnay, Red Knot Shiraz from Australia. Torres Grand Coronas is a Cabernet Sauvignon from Northeast Spain. And that's your favorite. Great. Have you, have you tasted that one uh, before, Alan, the Torres Grand Coronas? Very good. Yeah, that's one of my favorites as well. I find it's excellent value, uh, kind of in the $20 price range at the LCBO. Um, and, and just quite, quite nice. I think that would be quite enjoyable on a Friday night. I've had students say, you know, Oyster Bay or Kendall Jackson, Red Knot, I think would go great. Uh, I think any of these, uh, it's it's completely personal personal preference. And uh, there you go. I, I had a professor who didn't like uh, Sauvignon Blanc, wine wine professor who didn't like Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it's, it is a it is a unique unique style for sure, especially New Zealand style, which which as we saw can be quite herbaceous, quite uh, um, you know, pee pee du chat, cats cats beyond a gooseberry bush. Uh, so question number three, or shopping trip number three, is you need a Christmas gift for your boss who likes French wines. Chablis, very good. Of course, being the only French wine there. Uh, if you really wanted to tick him off, you could get him maybe the uh, Red Knot Shiraz, but <laughs> him or her. Okay, so that uh, pretty much uh, wraps up our class for today. Um, hope you Hope you enjoyed. Let's just do a quick review. Uh, now I've got the answers here, but uh, some of the what what are some of the main sparkling and fortified wines? So we covered Champagne, Cremant, Prosecco, Port, and Sherry. Can you name any other uh, sparkling or fortified wines that we talked about? Okay, so brandy is a spirit. Uh, so it's actually a a, a, a beverage alcohol spirit. Uh, that is used for port or sherry, uh, but maybe, uh, for example, Madeira, or um, it's not fortified, no. So brandy is what they use to fortify. Brandy is a, a grape spirit. Brandy uh, is, a, is a spirit, so a fully 40% or, or more uh, alcohol. Uh, and they use brandy to fortify port or sherry or, and make a fortified wine, which is going to be grape-based, lower in alcohol, that has uh, had some brandy, some spirit added to it. Uh, and in terms of some of the items we will see on a wine label, of course, producer, uh, perhaps region, vintage, and, of course, alcohol by volume on all labels. I would love if you could indicate something you enjoyed uh, learning in today's class, Alan. Uh, and if you're up for it, uh, mentioning that to me, Chuck, would be always much appreciated. Uh, thank you both uh, so much for taking part in Wine Foundations. It used to be called Wine Foundations. It's now Wine 101 uh, with Anologize. I uh, love the cream off. Fantastic. Glad to hear. I uh, hope you enjoyed your course. Hope you, hopefully you really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, always love uh, welcome feedback. Uh, please keep an eye out. I uh, will be sending in, uh, in the, in, uh, but via email, uh, your certif uh, certificate of completion uh, for Wine 101. So that should be coming out uh, 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 sometime uh, before tonight. Uh, and hope you enjoyed. Uh, thanks very much for taking part. And uh, look forward to uh, seeing you in the virtual classroom uh, sometime soon again. Very good. Yes, yeah. Uh, thank you for putting me in touch with Martha. I was uh, in touch with Martha. Uh, looking forward to uh, uh, hopefully having her in, in the classroom as well.